How are y'all this morning? We're so glad that you're here. Welcome to CLC, and we're going to start our time together this morning. We'd love to invite you to stand with us. We're going to start our time together in time of song, time of praise, time of worship. Today's going to be a good day. You guys believe it? 
Man, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us today at Community Life Church. My name is Scott Verno. I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and it is an honor to have you here in the building or have you joining us online. Man, I, this place has been prayed for. Your seats have been prayed for individually. We've been praying for you at home. We just believe that there is an encounter that God has for you today. And so don't let the junk of this world get in the way from you getting what God has for you. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's uh, start the service off by praying the Lord's Prayer together, and let's just dig on in. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we're so grateful for opportunities like this, just to, to gather our hearts together, regardless of all of the garbage and the things that we've walked through or had to listen to or had to deal with, or even those good things. God, we come and we spend time in the presence of the one who is truly good. And we recognize that, that you are the source. You are the one that offers life. You are the one that offers hope. And so today, as we press in in our time of worship, God, we pray that you would just deposit into us, Lord, those things that we need, those things that we hold on to that will carry us through the difficulties, the challenges of life. You know our families, what we're walking through, what we're dealing with. And we just pray that today you be God. We just entrust you with it today. Lead us and guide us. We love you. We trust you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are so thankful that you're here and that you chose to be here today to worship with us as one big family this morning. Um, it's so easy to bring to worship your, uh, your emotions and your week and some of the challenges and the fears and all the things. How many of you can relate to that? There's like so many things sometimes going on in life. But we don't go based on feeling. We don't worship God based on feeling. We worship Him based on truth and the faith. Can I get an amen for that this morning? So let's sing from our hearts. Let's worship Him. He's here today, and He's going to move in our hearts this morning. And I know it. it's going to be a great day. our eyes to a hope beyond the creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord
His light has overcome, amen, overcome the darkness. And not just uh, the darkness that lives in this world, because I know that there is uh, much darkness out there. Jesus Christ, He is Lord and He is greater than any darkness that's in the world. But also the darkness that oftentimes we find in ourselves, just the difficult things that maybe... uh, in our minds can can oftentimes overtake us and fear, depression, just so many things that oftentimes can really hold us back. But he's overcome that today. And Jesus is our hope. And it's in him that we lean, especially when we're feeling like that. We can just lean into all that he is. Let's just continue to worship him this morning.
you are ours. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made through your son so that we could make that claim. Because God, there's no way that we could ever possibly dream of making that claim without that sacrifice. We thank you for doing what we could not and upholding our end of, of the covenant for us simply so that we could be with you, Father, and that we could know you and draw near to you. We thank you for, for leading us into deeper waters, God, where our faith could be tested and, and purified and refined. And God, I, I pray that any hearts that are here today that, are, that, are, that feel like they're drowning in that deep water, God, that you would, uh, you would empower them through your spirit to, to keep their eyes fixed solely on Christ, and that you would strengthen their faith in that time, God. Father, I pray as Scott comes to deliver your word that you've prepared for him today, that that you would just move in us and move in our hearts and shape us into the likeness of your son, Jesus. We pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Before you guys are seated, if you'll turn around, shake a hand, get to know somebody around you, especially if it's somebody you don't know, shake a hand, give a hug, love on somebody, let them know you're glad you're here. Welcome to church. We are so glad that you're here because this church is much more than just a building. It's a family committed to loving God and loving people. This church is a safe place for anyone and everyone. No matter who you are, where you came from, or what you look like. Because at this church, we believe that God is many things. But most of all, God is love. And he has called us all to share his love with everyone. Welcome to church. Well, good morning. Hope everyone is doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today at Community Life Church on this 
killer Sunday morning. Uh, my name is Scott Verano, and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and it is an honor to have you here in our family room or have you joining us online. Uh, we are just so honored that you would spend this time with us today, and we just so appreciate you being here or connecting. At Community Life, we love God, we love our neighbor, and we believe that our mission is to connect people to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the source of life. And so if there's something we can do for you to help connect you to the source of life, let us know. If life just is just hammering you right now, come on, let us stand alongside you and support you, whatever it is that we can do. We're not gonna be always perfect as a church, but hopefully we'll continue to get better as we move forward, amen? So before I jump into the announcements, um, I have a group of folks to my left, your right, that are just awesome. Um, they're sitting in the section I love to sit in. It's our Encircle Life Ministry. Can we give them a big round of applause today? Yeah. Dude, look at Jeff. Uh. I sat over there and listened to them sing. I'm telling you, we just need to move them up on stage and let them get after it. Uh, I, I love that ministry, and they are so fantastic. Um, and they, they give me the business, too, from time to time, making sure that I'm doing my job right. I love it. So a um, couple quick announcements, and then we'll jump into the message. So uh, probably the, the, the most rounding thing, if you want to stay connected to the church or figure out what's going on, there are two QR codes in front of you. If you're here in the building, on the seat in front of you. Uh, if you're at home, we'll put them on the screen. The one on the left is an active QR code. Uh, you can use that QR code. It'll take you to all of the activities, all the things upcoming. If you need to register or find out more information, that's one way that you can do that. The one on the right is our giving QR code. Uh, if you'd like to give and help support us in, in connecting people to Jesus, we welcome you to do that. Uh, many of you, you are not a giving through a QR code type of person. Uh, you like to write checks, and we love check writers. Uh, so if you want to do that, before you leave the building, on each one of the doors, there's a, a white box, and you can drop your offering there. And thank you so much for, for supporting the ministry of this church um, and, and just connecting with us in that way. We appreciate it. Uh, two things I want to tell you about. So coming up on May 7th and 10th, we will have our Legacy Review Dinners. So what these two dinners are about, they're going to start at 6 o'clock on each one of those nights, and you do not have to register. You can just show up, and anybody is welcome to come. But at the beginning of this year, we had uh, gatherings called um, a Building on Our Legacy groups. And really, during that time, what we did is we invited folks to register to come in, and we asked you three questions. What is it you love about community life? What is it you're struggling with? And what do you want to do? And we just took notes and we went down whatever rabbit trail and chased every squirrel that was there in the room to chase. And we've synthesized all of those, put them together. And on the 7th and the 10th, we're going to disseminate that information back to you. Some of the things that we heard, we've already solved and we've worked on and some of the things we're working on. But going into the fall, if you want to know what we're going to look like going forward, we encourage you to come so that you can get all that information. Um, we'll have children's ministry uh, available each night, show up at six o'clock. We'll have food. We'll get the kids into children's ministry and then um, we're just, we're going to talk, hang out like a family, let you know about some of the exciting things that are coming up. And we just want to make sure we get that back out to you. So looking forward to that. Remember, you did not have to go to the legacy meetings to come that night. You're, you just want to come and get dinner. Come hang out with us and hear some fun stuff. And then the, the last announcement, and I'm going to tell you, this is probably my most favorite announcement to make every single year. Today is Culver's Custard Day. So Randy and Honey Smith, they're so awesome. They own Culver's, and every year they donate truckloads of custard for free to this church. And the youth ministry sells them. So for $4 today, you can buy a pint of custard because in Jesus' name, you need it. Um, <laughs> And all of that money goes to help support the mission of the youth. They're going to Belize this year, so you'll help support that trip. And uh, so we encourage you to do that. After last service, we couldn't hardly get you in the building because everybody was lined up to buy all the custard. So you can do that today. We can take cash. We can take card. If you have a, a debit card, we can do that outside. If you pre-ordered, and we sold a ton of pre-orders, you can pick those up in this hallway over here. But if you get out there and you forget, those teenagers, they love to run and burn off Culver's Custard. So, so ask them, they'll run and they'll go get it and they'll bring it to you. But, um, but I, I so appreciate Randy and Honey, as so many of you that, that, that love and support this church. And so today, even if you don't buy some custard, stop by and get a hamburger and get some cheese curds because they're awesome. And uh, just know that Jesus is allowing you to do that so that you can support them and they support all the churches. They're so awesome in the community. Amen? Amen. All right. So um, we're in a series, a three-part series called Before I Go. And, uh, and, and in this series, what we're doing is we're studying 
what's known in the scriptural study world as the farewell discourse or the Olivet Discourse. And what this is, is it's the last three to four to five hours of the life of Jesus and the conversations that he has with the disciples. So before he's arrested, this is their conversation. And there are multiple discourses, if you will, in the New Testament. Um, Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, that's a discourse. The, the section of scripture, the kingdom of heaven is like. Those are all part of a discourse. When Jesus sends out the disciples, there's a discourse where he prepares them and tells them what to expect. And, and so this is just another section where Jesus is having a conversation, but mostly it's his information to them where you can study it, understand it, and try to imagine what was going on in those moments. So, so to, just to put you in context, imagine if you were Jesus, you knew that say in five hours, you were going to be arrested and you would see the disciples from a distance and never be able to talk to them again. And you're about to leave the keys to the ministry in their hands. You've got three to four to five hours. This is that conversation. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, it's been a, it's been a challenge um, because to, to preach it is difficult, not because the, the points are hard to make, but, but the way Jesus speaks in these moments it's so theologically rich. I mean, it's just dripping with, with uh, understandings for the disciples that you know they weren't ever going to understand. But when I get up here and I read through it, um, there's so much of, of me that I, I don't want you to miss it. And, and so part of me, my teaching ability and part of trying to convey that in a way that makes sense, it's hard, which then gets me to the other point. And this series originally started out as a series on the Holy Spirit. Because in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John, during this discourse, Jesus really opens up the topic of the Holy Spirit for the disciples. He teaches them all this stuff, knowing that they're not going to hold it. And then he says, but don't worry, the Holy Spirit's here, and the Holy Spirit's going to do these things. So basically saying, and, and Jesus can probably feel better about it, I'm leaving, but the Holy Spirit's going to be here to help govern them and, and make sure that they're okay going forward. So even as I have trepidation about wading into these scriptures, in the most intimate time that Jesus had with the disciples, I can trust and know that where I fall short, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit can pick it up and help us to all understand and see what's going on in these chapters. So, um, so just try and put yourself in that mindset. What would you say if you had the last three to four hours of your life uh, to convey to the disciples what they needed to know? Now, last week we, we dove into John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, Jesus really does two big things. He starts to build the theology or the understanding of the connection between the Father and the Son, or better yet, understanding the Father by seeing the Son or seeing Jesus. And he starts off in a real interesting way. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. So in the course of the night and all of the downers that they had at the Last Supper, Judas is left because he's going to betray Jesus. Peter, who said, Jesus told the whole group, is going to deny him three times. Jesus telling them he's going to leave. And, and all of that brokenness and all of those things, Jesus then starts off by saying, guys, I go to prepare a place for you. And in the message last week, we talked about what that word place means. When we read it in a memorial service, we say, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Um, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not tell you that I go there to prepare a place for you and come back to take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. We think of that as heaven and it, and it is. But the word place is so much more than that. It's not, hey, I'm, I've got some wood and some nails and I'm going to go prepare a place for you. It's, there's a relationship. The, the crucifixion, the resurrection, I go to prepare a place or fix a connection for you. That understanding means home. That I'm going to reconnect or reestablish your ability to go home, to find what home means. And then he goes on to build the connection to the Father. If you want to go home, if you want to see what home looks like, look at the Son. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he builds that theology out for us to hold on to. And then when he gets done with that, then he introduces the topic of the Holy Spirit. Now, depending on where you've been to church, you either know a lot about the Holy Spirit and whatever that is, and you know, or you know nothing. Because a lot of faith systems, they either never talk about the Holy Spirit or they always talk about the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to do is understand the practical, relevant understanding of the, of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. And what you find in chapter 14 is that the Holy Spirit is a helper, 
The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, which means if you're a believer, you have the spirit of truth living inside you. So as you're struggling through life, you have one that will help you untangle the truth, discern what's right from what's wrong. You may not know you have that. You do. The Holy Spirit is is taught to be one who will teach you everything and will be with you forever. Remember, this conversation starts because Jesus says, I'm leaving. So now you know the Holy Spirit is going to be the one that is going to be present with you forever. And here's direct quote, and remind you of everything that I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit's responsibility after Jesus builds that theology of connection between the Father and the Son is to say, and don't worry, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of everything that I've said. So whatever your faith background is and whatever your understanding of the Holy Spirit, please know that the Holy Spirit is not some weird thing. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God in your life that helps you to untangle the mess that we're walking through by revealing truth, by pointing to Jesus, by bringing along this narrative and the righteousness that's in our life. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. So if you just take that chapter 14 and understand that, we're gonna build on it today while we dive into chapter 15. So here's the context. This farewell discourse happens between the Last Supper, which is John chapter 13, and Jesus being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is John chapter 18. Now, if you back up one chapter to 17, Jesus prays for his disciples. The whole chapter is a prayer. 14, 15, 16. At the end of our chapter last week, Jesus says, let's get up and let's go. So it's believed that during chapter 14 or that conversation, they were in the upper room at the Last Supper. But then they get up and they traverse, and where they're heading to is on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I wish I had a map for you. I wish I had a drawing. And some of y'all are like, if he doesn't show me a map, I'm leaving. No, I'm kidding. Y'all, know, y'all love maps. You love pictures. I just don't have one that laid it out this way. But the way Jerusalem is set up, the upper room would have been opposite the, the side of the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the other side of, of the Kidron Valley. So they would have gone through past near the temple. And some biblical scholars or some context will say that it's possible that maybe Jesus stopped by in the temple one last time. 100% maybe. And why do we say this? Because Jesus would use the things around him to make a point. And so if you just want to put yourself in the story and imagine that maybe this happened because it's very possible, he says this in verse number one. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. And you say, Scott, what does that have to do with the temple? Embossed around the entrance to the temple is a vine, a grapevine. And Israel in, throughout the Torah is underst- and through the, the prophets and through the Psalms is known as a vine that's supposed to provide sweet fruit to this world. And, and so oftentimes in scripture, God will re- reference the vine or the prophet will reference the vine. He says, you're producing rotten fruit. Like that's, that's how it comes out to you. But there at the temple was this vine. And so you can imagine Jesus possibly walking through or maybe he was walking by a vineyard walking through and he, he points at the vine and he says, I want you to know I'm the true vine and my father is the vine grover. So if you just want to put yourself in this story, imagine that last few hours of your life, Jesus is traversing through Jerusalem, heading across the Kidron Valley and over to the garden of Gethsemane. And he starts this conversation. So for the sake of our understanding through the rest of this text, Jesus is the vine. The father is the vine grower that's going to take care of the vine. Verse two, it says, he removes every branch in me that bears no fruit Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Now, this sounds like a terrible sales pitch for Christianity, but it's the truth, so I'm going to tell you. He says, if you have a branch in you that bears no fruit, God's going to cut it off. If you have a branch that bears fruit, God's going to prune it. So guess what? You're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. And why does Scott say that? I, I, I want to speak to you the truth because some people, they try to talk you into being a Christian by saying, if you become a believer, it's all um, angels' wings and bonbons. I don't know, right? Like, like no more problems in life. That is not this Bible. That is not what the gospel message teaches. It teaches about a father who, if you have things in your life that are not in keeping with, that are producing bad fruit or dead, he's going to lop it off. And guess what? If you're producing good fruit in your life, he's going to lop that off so that you can produce better fruit. Sounds pretty harsh, but it's the truth. 
It's about a father who cares about the health of the vine that wants the vine to produce. So that gives you an image and a picture of of the father that we're talking about. So it makes sense that Jesus is trying to relate this to the disciples, excuse me, and to us as we get to this point to better understand the father. In that verse three, where he says, "Um, you've already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you, that word cleansed, there's a word play that's going on that relates to, to pruned. So he's saying, but don't worry, you've already been cleansed. You've already been chopped up, pruned, ready for this situation. We don't see it because it's in the Greek, but here's what you need to know. He's letting the disciples know, but, but for this conversation, this understanding, you're connected, you're there, so the rest of this is gonna make sense. So that, that's the piece that sometimes we would miss if we didn't understand that, that terminology. So then we jump on in verse four. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. And that's such beautiful terminology. He says, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. So here's this awareness of Jesus asking the disciples to abide in me. And this is really weird. When we left our, my men's study on Wednesday morning, um, one of the thoughts was, well, how do you tell someone to abide? Another understanding in this is that this word abide connects to what we talked about last week and I go to prepare a place for you. It's the same word that runs through there. And so what Jesus is really saying is be at home in me is I am at home in you or have that connection, recognize that we are family. There's a close interpersonal relationship. Make sure that your heart is, is in keeping with. Does that, does that make a little bit more sense? And so when he says that, as hard as it is to say, do this, this, and this, and we're gonna get to that a little bit later, he's saying, abide in me as I abide in you. When he goes on into verse five, what he does is he, he pulls us into the metaphor, but gives us a place in the metaphor. He says, I'm the vine, and guess what? You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you bear nothing. So, so he's now bringing us into the metaphor and he's going to teach us what that means or he's going to teach the disciples what that means. Verse six, he says, whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Now verse six is one of the verses that I love to lift up always as a verse that's oftentimes used out of context. Um, people that like to look at this verse and say, turn or burn. Burn. Right, some of you come from a faith system where that was your normal Sunday routine. That's what you got to hear, how many different ways that you could mess up and and you had an image of a God that was ready to to throw you out. I want you to know that this makes sense when you think about the metaphor. If you have a branch in you, in your life, that's not bearing fruit, if you have a branch in your garden at home that's not bearing fruit and it's dead, what do you do with it? You get rid of it. You don't leave it there. If you are a person that wants your garden to live, wants it to make sense, you're gonna get that thing out of your life. But, but it also carries into our lives. We have things that either bear bad fruit or are dead, and God's gonna get that garbage out of there. It's not, a, it's not an indictment upon those people who don't, right? Like, it's a bigger understanding of the metaphor of how Jesus is going, or how the Father is going to cleanse those areas out of our lives. Verse seven. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now I had so much fun last week trying to make a sense and make a point to you because this was the same same verse that was there last week, that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give to you. In the Christian world, we've turned this into a genie in the bottle. The scripture says, if you ask for something in Jesus name, you're gonna get it. And so last week, my example was Lamborghini, 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 poof. Well, it didn't happen, so I can't be a believer, right? Like, that's not the way it's going to work. And and so the ultimate point is, um, if you're going to do something in the name of, if you're going to pray in the name of, it means that you are an extension of the power or of the understanding of that person. And so if you're going to pray in the name of, then it's going to be in keeping with the design for. So then I had a little problem this week. So this week, I came home, I don't remember what day it was, and Tammy says, hey, you, you got an Amazon package. I said, no, my dear, I never get Amazon packages. You, on the other hand, get lots of Amazon packages. I almost died trying to get in the front door. I I said, I I don't. So she goes, oh, no, 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 this one is for you. And I thought, I remember thinking, we've got to call, you know, like a national security service because I don't get packages and somebody is doing something pretty crazy. So I opened that thing with tongs. 
I'm just telling you, man, I lived through the 80s. I know about mail that you're not supposed to open. And so I was opening that thing pointed towards Tammy. <laughs> or the dogs. I was pointing towards the dogs. Okay, that's, that sounds better. And I got my Lamborghini, y'all. So I learned a little something this week to be more specific in my prayers. <laughs> and I'm kind of tore up because I, I, don't know, I don't know what to do now because I don't know if what I said was right or was it wrong. Um, Clint and I were walking into the church across the, the back 40 there. And uh, Clint said, and I, I told him the story and he started laughing. He said, so what are you going to say this week? And I said, it's going to be hard to say, but I'm going to do it. Uh, land in Montana, land in Montana, land in Montana, poof! <laughs> uh, it doesn't have the same rhyme to it, but... I'll be waiting outside for my Amazon package to come in this week. I'm going to figure that out. Or maybe I should go with the scripture, right? Like we should just just lean into that. Um, So you understand the point? It's not a genie in a bottle. Um, it's, It's when you're connected to, when you do something in the name of you, ask in the name of the Father, it means because you are an extension of the Father, you carry that same power. You're not going to do something that is not in keeping with the Father. So that, that makes sense. It's not, it's not a genie in a bottle. I'm going to quit saying that. That's enough times. Um, verse, uh, I don't know. Seven? No, nope, eight. We're on eight. Okay, so um, he says, I love this. Do you want to know how to glorify the Father? Jesus tells us. He says, my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. So Jesus is establishing for the disciples, this is kind of a continuation of chapter 14, if you want to glorify the Father, um, bear, and, and bear fruit and become my disciples. And now he's going to explain it. Verse nine, as the Father has loved me, so I loved you. So there you can see the connection. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And so in this understanding, he pulls us in and connects us to the love of the Father. Father loves the Son. Son loves us. We're connected. We abide. This is that picture of home, of finding the the lover of our soul and how God pulls us all together. Um, abiding in the love of Christ, who, who abides in the love of the Father, and that is by extension passed on to us in, in the full awareness. And, um, and his direct understanding in doing this is to say, if you keep my commandments, then you will abide in my love. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but there's a powerful truth. We open up every part of the sermon with the commandments, the two commandments that Jesus gave us, which is, what's the first one? We will love and we love. Those are the commandments. He says, if you keep my commandments, then you will abide. That, that's how he puts it out there for them to be able to do it. He, he knew we would, he didn't want to go down the whole list. And so he categorized them as two. There's the vertical nature of loving God and there's the horizontal nature of loving our neighbor. Verse 12. Can I skip anything? Yes, verse 12. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that, that, um, greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And so he's setting the stage now for what's about to happen with his death, burial, resurrection. And, and here's the thing. The, the son, the father's son, is going to set the foundation by setting the bar at the greatest thing you can do is to give your life. That's the greatest expression of love. And now what he's going to do in these next few verses from verse 12 all the way down through 17 is he's going to elevate our connection to the father. He's going to use the word friend. It's synonymous with brother because the word is phileo. So think brotherly love. You go to a church and someone calls you brother so-and-so. This is where he kind of elevates our role in our connection to the father. He says in verse 13, uh, verse, oh, verse 14, I got to deal with. This one's insane. It's just like, it seems like a one-off. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, could you imagine saying to someone, you can be my friend if you do exactly what I tell you to do? <laughs> like we read that and we're like, eh, wait a minute now, that seems a little crazy. But what he's doing is he's stating the obvious. If the command is to love God, to love our neighbor, then by definition, to be a friend means to live into those commands. So Jesus is defining. It's, it's lost on us in translation. The words are there, but the intent doesn't make sense into the Western world because of the way that they're carried. But, but that hopefully makes more sense when you think about it. Verse 15, he says, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. So there's a, a different connection, a different interpersonal connection. I, I tried to wrestle this morning with 
um, with this thought, and, and this is Scott, so this may not be God, this may be make, make, making it up, but you know, sometimes your friends know more about you than your own brothers or sisters in your immediate family, right? So think of the connection that's here, Jesus sharing with them, Jesus connecting them. He's not trying to disconnect because the whole thing is about being connected in family, so he's not trying to say that, but, you, but maybe that's the point. Verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, eternal, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name, an extension from the Father in the name of Jesus. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. So he pulls it all together and talks about their role going forward, bearing fruit, loving one another. So that's how he pulls them in and says there's a, and he starts this understanding of you are to be set apart, that there's a, there's a different awareness of our connection and our peace of being together. So now verses 18 down through verse 21, there is, um, this is where you start to delineate. That whole first part was abiding, family, home. Now we're gonna get a taste of the rest of it. Think he's, he's preparing them for what they're gonna look at. Verse 18, it says, if the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. So he's preparing them. He says, if you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. Now, that's my influence, or in inflection. The world's gonna love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but, have chose, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, servants are not greater than their master. Do you remember in, in John chapter 13, Jesus gets up and he washes the feet of the disciples. And when he gets done, he sits down, he says, do you know what I've done to you or for you? He says, I want you to know that a servant is not greater than his master. So if I wash feet, guess who else washes feet? Right? So he tells them, he says, if I can wash your feet, guess whose feet you're washing? You're going to wash each other's feet. So here he says, remember I told you servants are not greater than their masters. If they persecuted me, guess who else is getting persecuted? He's welcoming him to the party. He's letting them know. He says, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So he starts to draw this distinction between the world and between um, this connection or this familial understanding. Verse 21, he says, but they will do all things to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. Now with that thought in mind, Jesus then gives us another portion of awareness that comes as a result of us, being ab of us abiding. Um, no longer is I didn't know an excuse because Jesus walked this earth as the image of God, the Father. And so here's what he says, verse 22. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates the Father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And there are multiple places in scripture where prophets or the Psalms say that exact terminology, that I'm gonna go to them and they're not only gonna not receive me, they're going to reject me over and over and over again. It said, one of the, one of the specifics, in case you wanna go back and look at it, uh, Psalm 69, four, speaking of Jesus, speaking of that Messiah Psalm, that the Messiah will be rejected. So it gives you the image of what he's trying to say, that if they're gonna reject me, they're gonna reject you, and it's a fulfillment of scripture. And then um, we get to verse 26 and 27. I haven't said anything about the Holy Spirit yet, right? And I told you each one of these chapters contains a little piece of that. And so now you're gonna get to hear that insight about the Holy Spirit. And it, and it almost seems like a tag on, but we're gonna, we're gonna look at it in just a second. He says, when the advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. So remember, he's talking about the difference between those who will receive you, those who won't, the greater connection, going home, and the role of the res and responsibility of the Holy Spirit is to testify, to sort out the lines in between. Make sense? So there's an external outreaching part and awareness of the Holy Spirit that is going to take the story, the message of Jesus, the fruit that's being produced, and then carry it to, to the world that so desperately needs it. In verse 27, and he doesn't leave, leave us out of the equation, he says, you also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. And so your role is to take and continue on, is to take this message and, and, and disseminate it or to testify. But it's not devoid of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that untangles um, 
helps you to discern, helps you to understand and, and bring it to fruition in someone's life. Is that cool? That's a terrible question. Do you enjoy going through scripture in that manner? <laughs> abide in me as I abide in you. Um, and, and I'll just say that Tammy's closing is the song Abide in Me. And uh, I've been listening to it all week as she's been playing it. She has, she has an old, we have an old piano in the house that, her, that she had when she was a child that her mother brought from Oklahoma. We stuck it in the living room. And when she bangs on that thing, it just rings throughout the house. There's something about this song um, that will just speak to your heart. So I say that to give you something to expect to look forward to, um, to just kind of bring you back to a place to where you can just, just reconnect your heart. But um, when you think of abide in me as I abide in you, it's some of the most beautiful poetic scripture. So many commentaries, so many biblical scholars, whatever you want to say, they try to give you tons of imagery as to a better way to understand this. Um, one that, that jumped out to me was, was imagining God as a body of water and you just diving into that body of water and being immersed. The water presses in around you. The water lifts you. Um, the water regulates your temperature. It starts to permeate. It starts to saturate you. You are in the water, and the water is in you. And, and maybe that, that, that falls short, but it's a beautiful image of the same story, trying to understand the vine. But there's so many different ways to look at it and try to wrestle it through. But I'll tell you, as I studied this week, my struggle um, was this. And, and I, I, it was day after day after day, even through the men's Bible study, I was still just bent on teaching this in a particular way. And, and as I got through the rest of the week, just things started to untangle a little bit. And I hope this makes sense to you. And, and, and so my, my spiritual gifting, in case you don't know, is the gift of serving or service. I will not be the smartest guy in the room, no amens, um, not the most knowledgeable or the most wise, but if I have the stamina and the ability, I will outwork you. It's what God has put in my life. It's how I get to this place. I, it's just my gift. It's what God has given me to do. I'm by nature a servant. And so here's, here's the challenge that that brings to my life. When I look at this scripture, it's abide, it's fruit. I skip right over the abide and I start to look at the fruit. This has to be about producing fruit. Fruit, fruit, fruit. What have you done for me lately? Has to be about something that we can go do and we can go be. But, but here's the issue. When have you ever seen a tree struggle to produce fruit? Right? Like, it just doesn't happen. So you can't understand producing fruit if you miss the main point of the whole chapter, which is to abide. And so if I told you that producing fruit was the main point, I would have missed the main point. The main point of chapter 15 is to abide. And here's what you find, is that the rest of this chapter is a result of abiding in Christ, being fruitful, giving glory to the Father, finding your place, not in this world, but being connected, being persecuted by this world, recognizing sin and not being ignorant of sin, um, being pruned, being adjusted, bearing fruit. All of those things are, are not things that we inherently just go do. Those are things that happen as a result of abiding. And so with that in mind, just for a few moments, I want to talk about what it means to abide. And the very foundational thing that you have to know in this chapter is that it is so connected to the chapter before. That awareness of abiding comes from that single word. Um, to abide means from, from the root of the word mino, which comes the word abide, remain. It's where you get the root for the word a place. And all of them get back to a connection, a deep personal connection or better put, home. For you to find your home, to find your place, to find your connection. And so all of these speak back to that. Another use of the word in, 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 the, in the Gospel of John is found in John chapter one, um, where, where Jesus is baptized. And when he comes up out of the water, he hears the Father, and the Spirit descends on him like, uh, like a dove and rests on him or remains on him. That word is, this, is from the same root of this word, mino. So all throughout John's gospel, there is the image of this greater connection or community that's found in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and now it's being extended to us. It's a calling back home, if you will. Now, why do I say this? Well, what is this? If we're going to talk about abiding, why does this matter? And let me give you another metaphor. I started to think today about, um, about our, our, 
our family of origin, our family of origin. Maybe, maybe this will help you to make sense when you think of home. That all of us, and I, I say, so think about your family of origin, and some of you are like, okay. And some of you are like, oh, please don't make me do that. Um, and some of you, you don't know your family of origin. Like maybe you were adopted or, or there's things that you don't know. But, but here's one thing. We all have a family of origin, and you would be able to recognize your family of origin in some ways by what you look like, what you sound like, what your medical issues are like because of your family of origin. I, my red hair, Grandpa Red. My chicken legs, Grandpa Red. I mean, thank, thanks to Grandpa Red. I guess this is where they all come from. There is a connection to my family of origin. You know this. If you have children, there has been a time in your life where you heard them say something and you went, oh, like that just reminds me of my father or reminds me of, of Grandpa or whatever it is because there's a connection when you look at the family. So if we're gonna think about abiding, you know, you can't not have a family of origin. You can't not disabide. I'm making up a word, right? Like you can't, there are parts of you that you can never pull away from your family of origin. So there's the imagery that speaks of that. It's what it means to abide. But consider this, had this thought this morning, last minute change to the message. We were originally created in the image of whom? God. So guess who your original origin family is? God. You were created in the image of God, so Jesus is your family of origin. And here's what I want you to know, that we all have this spark of the spirit of God that's inside of us, that when Jesus says, abide in me or remain in me, and you look and you discern and you think, there are parts of this message, the Holy Spirit doing it, that starts to uncover where you feel yourself being called back home. You feel yourself, you feel yourself called to the, I don't know how else to say it, the lover of your soul, the creator of your soul, the one who spoke life over you. There is a connection that we're called to that is inside of every single person because that is ultimately our family of origin. That it's the image that we're created in. And when Jesus recreated, I go to prepare a place for you, that's what he's talking about when he means to abide. And here's what I would say. If you're not a believer, my prayer is that today you come home. That you can experience in this life the design that God ultimately has for your soul, for you to find purpose and design and be connected to all of those things that God intended for you. But because of this broken world, you're forever searching for. That's the role of the Holy Spirit to bring those things about in your life. So, so just to give you a, a, just a, a little bit more insight on that, um, Paul teaches about the fruit of the Spirit. So we're gonna talk about fruitfulness and what this looks like in, in Galatians chapter five, verse 22. Um, just prior to verse 22, he talks about the things that are not of the Spirit and then he gives you the things of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit are this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those things are incredible when you think about them. Have you ever walked into a place and you said, oh, there's just something about that place? Or have you ever walked into a place and you said, there's just something about that place? Right? You hear me? You recognize and you know and you can tell where home is. And for some of you, God is calling you home. God is calling you to abide. God is calling you back to that place. To, to where you can reestablish and start to produce. Now, now, I don't know what to do with all of this, except to say there's two things that really jump out to me about it. The first thing is I love the heart of God. The heart of God is so powerful and so beautiful that in all of this, in the abiding, that God is never just exclusive to where he closes us off and where we're producing fruit for just one another. Yes, that fruit is produced for one another because we live in the joy and the peace. And if you're in a place that doesn't have those things, you wanna get out of them. But when you attend a church or you're a part of a family that, that, is, that is a family of believers, you experience the presence of God that looks a lot like that connection that God originally had. But there's something so powerful about the spirit of God that the fruit that we produce in our lives is not just for us to see and to be a part of, it's also for those that are broken and far off. And that's why it's so powerful when we read about the Holy Spirit who will be the one that testifies. So when we produce fruit in our lives, we're not just doing it so that we can live happy, healthy lives. We're doing it so that people can taste and see that the Lord is good. So many faith systems, they give God this image of the God that is just waiting for you to mess up so that he can throw you in hell. I want you to know that God is doing every single thing he can to reach you. 
offering you things that you can taste and things that you can experience that give you just a reconnection back to the heart. And so for me, a part of this message is once again, in these last moments of the life of Jesus, for the disciples to get a picture of the image of God that is out facing is so powerful. The other part of this is, is when you try to think about what it means to abide. Um, he actually tells us, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as the Father kept my commandments and abide in my love. So just, just wrestle with this. The actual message is so simple. The commandments are, we love God, we love our neighbor. And the verse 26, coupled with the Holy Spirit, is we connect people to Jesus or we testify because the responsibility is the point of Jesus. So the literal point of all of this is the mission of what we live into. And, and, and not just this church, it's the mission and the calling that, that, that Jesus gave the church. So what Jesus is doing is he's reestablishing the mission of the church. You love God, you love your neighbor, and you connect people to Jesus. That's, he's reestablishing the church and he's letting them know how all of that works together. Amen? Amen. And the last thing I would say before I pray and, um, and Tammy comes out and sings for us is, is if you're here today and you've been afraid Come home. Come home. There is nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear except a God that loves you and wants to bring you to a healthy place in life. And, and I'm not going to tell you that, that that's painless. There's a challenge that goes along with that. But I want to tell you that if you open up your heart, you will find the desire, the purpose, and the ultimate reason that you are on this planet. Just, just come home today. Open up your heart and choose to believe. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you. And I thank you, God, that this scripture... Oh, it always gives us a way. And, and it's through your son, God, seeing the life that was so willingly laid down for us so that we could find our way back home. And God, I just, I start today with my own life and say, God, I, I wanna be the one that abides. I wanna be the one that if the branches are on me that aren't in keeping with you, just get rid of them. And those that need to be pruned, prune them so that we can continue to bear fruit, not for our glory, but God, for the glory of your kingdom and the work that you're doing, because it's the only way to transform this world. There are so many people that are lost and lonely and God, they need to experience and taste and see that you're good. So allow us to get to that place, God. And I just, Lord, I thank you that today you're welcoming people home to experience the lover of their soul, loving them in ways that maybe they never have before. As we just open up our hearts and we say, Jesus, be my Lord. Show me the way to the Father. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. I invite you, if you will, to stand with me. And uh, Tammy's going to lead us in this song. I encourage you to sing along or, or allow the words to just minister to your heart. Um, Addie is here on the front if you'd like someone to pray with, and I'll be down on the other side. But thank you for your time this morning. Abide in me. Abide in me. Sing your Holy Spirit. And abide in me And whatever it takes Create in me the space And make my heart a place Designed for thee Lord, come abide in me And abide in me Abide in me, Spirit of truth, come and abide in me. You came to compensate, now the price is open paid with the life you freely gave at Calvary. Lord, come abide in me. my heart
and abide in me. Come and restore what you made me for. As she waited at the door, now here's the key. abide in this place or abide online. And if you're in this room and you think you're just going to camp out here, let me guarantee you that you're not. And here's how I know, because Vacation Bible School is right around the corner and there's about to be 7,000 children in this place. And you're going to want to run for the hills when that happens. I guarantee it. But instead, Jesus says, abide in me. So when we leave this place long after we're gone, we're still staying connected to that source of life. If you are new here, if you're looking for a way to get connected, Maybe you've been here for a while, you want to learn to uh, or find a way to get grow and, and connect in that way. Meet us out here in the Next Steps room. We'd love to help you get connected. And, uh, and, and another way you can do it is through our discovery class. A new class starts next Sunday. If you just want to know more about this place and what God is doing in the, the life of our people, it's pretty exciting. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you so much. God, to give us that strength, that love, the gifts and graces to face this world. God, we know that uh, not from our own doing, our own strength, that we find peace and grace. God, the fruits of the spirits don't pop out because we are able, but God, because of the work that you're doing inside of us. So God, help us to be your people. And after we leave this place and after we log off, God, that we would be able to, to go into those communities, go into those places that you've called us to go and bring the hope and the forgiveness, the love and the peace of your son, Jesus. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. We love you all. Have a wonderful week.